Hey everybody, I want to welcome you to another InventRight live stream. Uh, if you could type in, just maybe a few of you type in uh, yes, at least one of you, that you can hear me fine. Um, I was listening to the audio of the last live stream I did um, last week, and I was like, you know, I wasn't happy with the audio quality. I was using the microphone on my uh, Mac, and I just didn't think it sounded that good. So that's why I'm wearing this geeky headset here. I don't think you guys care what I look like. You just want good advice. Um, so looks like we have very few people on so far. Sometimes we have anywhere from 65 to 115 people. And right now there's only six. So I don't know what's going on with that. Um, I'm assuming we post it to all the regular places we post to. Um, thank you, V, for confirming that you can hear me. That is a really small audience. Wow, four now? Like, I'm assuming there's something. I'm thinking that maybe we shared the wrong link or something like that. Um, or maybe you guys are just filing in and everybody's just a little bit late. Um, okay. Good. Yeah, I, I'm assuming things are going to get an uptick. I think two times ago we had 115 people on live, so that was really cool. Um, but anyway, let's go get get to some questions. Um, thank you, everybody. All right. We love you here in Canada. Yeah, we love you here in the U.S. too. Thank, thank you. I love it. Great. Canadians are, are great people. Uh, you know, most people around the world are great people. Um not going to get into politics or anything, it just because I've been watching this uh, travel show on YouTube. I'm a big YouTube fan. I watch a lot of YouTube. And I've been watching this guy, uh, Drew Binsky. He's a guy from um, Arizona. And he's traveled to, I think, every country in the world now. I think he has like three or four more countries, every country in the world. And I really like what he was saying. He said, people are just people. And, and for the most part, people are nice almost everywhere. And you can't just go by uh, whatever the government's doing or politicians are doing. So I just think it's a really cool show. And I just want to give a shout out to him because I'm enjoying his YouTube show. Uh, his name is Drew Binsky, and he travels around the world. He does a lot of interesting shows. Um, so what we're talking about on InventRight is licensing. So just give a brief summary for those of you who have been here before. You've heard this before. But for those of you that are new, you like to hear it real quick. Licensing, it's their money. Um, let me take, let me turn off my Skype account here so I don't get distracted. It's very distracting. So with licensing, when you license to a big company, it's their money and it's their workforce, manufacturing, advertising, distribution, and their, and their distribution. So their money, the workforce, and the distribution you get it all in one place, which is a beautiful thing. These are large companies and you can, I joke, you can have delusions of grandeur and you're not delusional because maybe they can sell 20,000, 50,000, 200,000, 2 million units. It depends on the product. Is it a 99 cent product? Is it a $500 product? So, but that's not um, a weird thing for a big company to do. And when you're getting a royalty off every unit, that's really, really cool. Now with licensing, you don't make money overnight. You know, it takes them quite a while to launch a product. Then you get paid your royalties quarterly. So anybody that feels like it's the way you're not selling tchotchkes on eBay where you're making a few bucks here, there, you're making a pretty decent amount of money or nothing at all. But you don't have to start a business. You don't need $10,000 for a patent. You don't necessarily for a lot of times even have to have a prototype. You can do a virtual prototype. You can do a marketing piece. And they're like, oh, yeah, we understand that. We can make that. So why'd you go out and blow $5,000 on a prototype? It varies. But a lot of what InventRight does, and if you watch our channel, it's to empower inventors with you don't try to pinch pennies where you're trying to save so much money you're hurting yourself. But in a lot of instances, you don't need to spend a lot of money. You actually need to spend very little money for most projects in order to license your product. So it's it's a very empowering approach. We've been doing InventRight for 21 years. We've had students in over um, 65 countries over that time. We need to take a look at that and see what it is now. All the 65 sounds like enough. Um, yeah, some of those countries are like a French Polynesian island that's a tiny little country or something like that. And I realize that, but it's still pretty cool. It sounds cool. I like it. I think it's really nice that anybody anywhere in the world, whether it's a small town, sometimes I have people call me up, oh, I'm this really small town in the Midwest, Andrew, and you don't know how it is around here. I'm like, I don't care how it is around there. 
makes no difference. Don't limit yourself to your geography. It doesn't matter if you're in New York or LA or Miami or in that tiny little town when you're licensing, they just want good ideas. So there's so many really empowering things about licensing. Um, I get really excited about it. So let's uh, jump in. We're getting a, the count up a little bit, but man, it's a small crowd. I don't know why that is. Um, I don't know if people are going on spring break with their kids yet or not, or we gave the wrong link and people are just finding it. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to help the people that are here. Um, uh, Alexander, Alexander said, I'm, I'm glad I'll be here on time for the Q&A. Alexander, yeah, good. And I, I spent a good uh, six minutes rambling there. <laughs> so let's get started. So sorry for the delay. Um, uh, Caleb says, I'm struggling with my first PPA. Will you please explain Smart IP more? Thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, Smart IP is a solution that we sell for 99 bucks on our site, which kind of walks you through with some videos with patent attorney Gene Quinn. And if you go to inventright.com, you can find it under other services under a provisional patent. And it walks you through filing the provisional. Um, and it's not that hard. You kind of choose like, is it a mechanical invention, electronic, like different category? Is it a game? What kind of category? It kind of gives you a, a template, but it's like a piece by piece and it guides you through filing your provisional. Um, so I firmly believe that inventors can file their own provisionals. I think filing your own patent is nuts. If you ever looked at a patent, it's in all this mumbo jumbo legal speak, you know? And so that's something that a patent attorney should do. But Filing your own provisional, you can do that in common English and anybody can do that. That was the whole purpose of the provisional. So any patent attorney that says they don't believe in provisionals or filing provisionals, they're just trying to get that 10 grand from a patent out of you. Because I think that um, I have students that don't have a GED that are able to do a good job with their provisional. The thing that I'll say, in addition to using that software, is always think about the variations and workarounds. That's 80% of filing a provisional patent or a patent. You got to think about all the other ways of doing it and throw it in there. Not a version that's half as good. That's getting obsessive. But a version that's like 70, 80, 90% as good. Maybe just as good, but not the version you're pitching. So, and a lot of people that go below 10 grand on a patent, they don't do that. And that'll hurt you. So why? It doesn't cost you anything more to go back to inventing. The problem is when you're an inventor, you, you at some point you've been thinking about this thing for a year, or six months or two years or whatever. And it becomes fixed in your head as to what it is. So I see inventors lose their creativity with that particular product because they've been thinking about it for so long. And so when they need to kind of get out of that mindset, yeah, for the marketing piece, this is what the product is. But for the provisional patent, you need to knock yourself off and think about the other versions and throw it in there. So that's my big tip that I always give people with PPA. So Caleb, hopefully that was helpful to you. Um, we include that unlimited filing of provisionals or writing of provisionals with our coaching program, but you can buy the one-time use on our site separately. It's only 99 bucks. And then the patent office only charges 75 if you're a micro entity earning under a certain amount of money per year. You can do their form on the patent office site. Most of you, a lot of you will qualify as a micro entity, but if, if you're not, it's only 150, I think. So um, let's get on to V. I'm having, Trouble getting in contact. Wow, still a fairly small audience. I don't remember last time we had such a small audience. Um, yeah, it makes me think we gave the wrong link. I don't have time to check it because I'm going to take care of you guys right now. It's too late for that. Um, I'm having trouble getting in contact with the marketing manager at Universal Studios. Okay, so with regards to product licensing, I'm wondering why you're trying to get in hold of the contact, a marketing manager for Universal Studios. It's a movie studio. Um, I contacted the guest services and they said they're not allowed to give contact information for the marketing manager. I tried LinkedIn and sent my sell sheet to their corporate office that the guest services provide. So V, why don't you tell me why you're trying to get a hold of a marketing manager for Universal Studios? Do not disclose, a little disclaimer here, do not disclose anything confidential in the chat. Um, anything I share should not be considered legal advice. Seek the service of an attorney before you move forward with anything. But V, if you could type in what, what generally, what product category you're in that you'd be reaching out to a marketing manager at Universal Studios, and then I can figure out if you should even be doing that, which my guess is you shouldn't. Um, well, well, let's let's answer that as best we can without the details from V. You contact marketing managers for product-related companies 
that um, brands that are in the major retailers you want to be, Walmart or Target or Bed Bath & Beyond or Walgreens or Rite Aid or Home Depot or Lowe's. So you contact the marketing managers for those brands that are selling at those places. So Universal Studios, much like Disney, if you see Universal Studios products, it's probably not their product, just like Disney. So Disney will license, called brand licensing, the license the rights to put these characters, whatever Disney latest thing is, my daughter who's eight, Descendants is a trend now. Now she doesn't like that anymore. <laughs> she wanted to buy all bedroom furniture. Descendants. I'm like telling my wife. I'm like, yeah, she might not like them anymore. In like four months. We're not doing that. And sure enough, she's she's like, no, nah, I'm not into that anymore, Dad. But anyway, Disney, Universal Studios, Iron Man. I don't know if that's a Universal Studio thing, but they license the rights to companies making T-shirts and mugs and action figures and products to put to use that on the product or to do an action figure and then you just get a royalty and then that manufacturer manufactures now they're very strict style sheet they've got to get approval on everything but there's usually another manufacturer that makes that product it's not universal studios that would actually license the product it's the companies that are doing universal studios let's say iron man i don't forget if that's a universal studios product but um and you license to them you license the companies that are already making Universal Studios related stuff because you know they already have the license with Universal Studios, right? And you probably thought that was Universal product, but most of the time it's not. Same thing with Disney. So if you want to clarify the what type, why you're reaching out to Universal Studios, you might be just wasting your time. If you're pitching a script or something, the licensing that we teach can apply to all sorts of different things, products and services and industrial products and consumer products and business to business products. But, and some of it could apply to pitching scripts, but Hollywood um, and pitching a movie or a TV show is a whole nother animal. There's a different set of rules. And I guarantee you there's some mentor or coach or somebody out there that can show you how to do that. Um, uh, Steve and I have been candidates for several um, potential TV shows. And so when Hollywood calls these days, and they go, oh, we love you guys. We want to do a show based around, we don't even get excited anymore because they're so flaky. Um, now, I also realize where they're coming from. They have to pitch a lot of shows before they get one of the hits. And so we've involved in things that were potentially work out, um, but never did. And that's, that's okay. And we'd love to do a, uh, um, uh, 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 something better than Shark Tank, I think. Shark Tank's very entertaining. I don't know if we could compete with Shark Tank. It's an entertaining show. There's not a lot of reality to reality TV, you know? And so I think uh, licensing is way sexier than Shark Tank, the reality of it, when you do it in real life. But could we make it an interesting TV show? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a big... I'm not saying I'm not, I'm, I used to be a fan of Shark Tank, but I, so many misperceptions come from that show. Mr. Wonderful said, you got a patent on that? Thanks for good TV. That's what the layman thinks is important, but we get students licensing up all the time with just a provisional patent and the company doesn't care if they have a patent or not. So it creates misperceptions there. Also, there's this big misperception, oh, if we get the money, everything will fall into place. Well, you're starting a one product company from scratch. Retailers don't want anything to do with you. And they know that whatever you were on uh, Shark Tank, they will quickly be forgotten weeks later. So don't think that retailers are gonna beat your door down just because you're on Shark Tank. Everybody's forgotten about it. They want a um, company that's gonna be constantly pushing that product, not just getting it in stores, but keeping it in stores. And so um, it's not what you think. So, but if we could do a great show that educates people about licensing on TV, that would be amazing. We would love to do that. Um, I think Steve would agree with that. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, Pepe, let me tell you that I already made my cold calls and I have emails to send my product information. The next step is to say, the advantages in a sentence and ask permission to send the sell sheet, right? Question mark. Um, you don't have to say the advantages even. You can just say, I have a product that I've, I've looked at your product line and I believe my product's the right match for your product line. Can I send you my sell sheet? You can give them the one sentence benefit statement, but why not just say you believe it's the right match for their product line? I'm looking to license this to you. Can I send you my sell sheet? And But you're right. We have also said that you can state that one sentence benefit statement too. But what if it's – I worry about non-invent right students doing that because 
you think it's a good benefit statement, but it's actually quite confusing. And sometimes what a good benefit statement is in a cell sheet with the graphic, like you have a benefit statement, makes it easier to uh, skin potatoes, you know, uh, faster, easier way to skin potatoes, okay, or whatever it is. And then you got the picture, it's like, oh, benefit statement, oh, picture, ah, oh, I get it. But now you could say that particular one on the phone and it'd be intriguing, but what if they try to judge it right there and they're like, no, not interested. Well, it might be doing you a favor, but if they saw the sell sheet, they might've been more intrigued. Um, so Pepe, for the most part, I would just say it's a right, you believe it's a right match for that. You've looked at their product line, you believe it's the right match, can I send it to you? But you can state a one sentence benefit statement. And it really is a good idea to have a sentence that sounds good. So if somebody does wanna screen it a bit that you can say it. So I'm not against it, but I worry that non-invent right students, students that aren't getting coaching from one of our coaches, it's you think it's good and it's not. You know, so if you just keep it general for you non-invent right students, you know, I have a product that's a good match. That would always work. I think it's a good match for your product line. I looked at your product line. Oh, okay. And you know, the companies have told us here at Invent Right that um they get very aggravated from an endless string of inventors submitting stuff to them that's just obviously not a right match for their product line, you know. Um, and, you know, we sent an email out to a public list, not to our students. And we said this one particular company was open to ideas. And this particular gentleman was off to a trade show. Like he, the next week he had a trade show. And it's very overwhelming for a marketing manager. And it was a smaller company. And um, he handled all the submissions, just him by himself, which was really cool. He was the president. Um, and um, he got really mad at us. And he said, oh, my God, I'm getting people submitting me stuff that's not even remotely right for our company. Did they even look at our website? All the inventor heard was they're open to ideas. And they just started piling all this crap on them that was – and the presentations were terrible, too. And so we learned not to do that anymore. And when we do occasionally, um, we always talk about, look, don't send any, look at their product line first. Don't make us look bad, you know, sort of thing. So um, yeah, you don't have to say the sentence over the phone or on LinkedIn or what have you. Say you think it's the right match for their product line and you took a look at it. Um, okay. Uh, Rafat, uh, Thank you so much for your advice. What do you what do you do if a company says they can't change something in their manufacturing chain to make your product? <clears throat> well, it's too you know if they looked at your product and they said that, well then you're done. They looked at the product, they weren't intrigued enough by the product to want to make a change. Any company can make a change if they believe it has enough benefit. Now if they said that, and you didn't show them your product, they didn't review it, well, what they're basically telling you is, we were not interested in receiving products from the outside. And that's kind of a generic way of saying it. Um, it's a, they don't normally say that, but what they're saying is we, we don't wanna change, we don't wanna change anything in our manufacturing at all in any way, shape or form. If they saw the product and they said it, you can say, oh, well, can, let me see if I can accommodate your existing manufacturing techniques, right? Um, but you just might need to move on. You're going to get a lot of no's. And that just may have been their way of saying, um, we're, we're, we just don't license products, you know? So I can't know what's in their head, but it could be one of those things. Um, uh, Pepe said, uh, if I find an interested company, can I count on you to help me negotiate? Yes, you can. You can sign up for a coaching program after you've got interest and then we'll help you with that company plus everything else reaching out to more companies one of the biggest mistakes that inventors make is when they get interest from one they just go this these are my guys you're so happy you got interest you can't do that you want to shoot yourself in the head because if if you do that because if if you get interest and the back and forth can be months and then after two months they're like oh we decided not to and you're like oh no Okay, now I gotta call three more companies. Get another one interested, two months. This is gonna string this thing out forever. You need to, it's like a shotgun blast and you get everybody at the same time. And and you don't go, oh, these are my guys because they showed interest. So, um, but to get to your question more specifically, can we help you negotiate? Yeah, we have a negotiation coach who can help you through that. Now, 
the thing is, I talk to people that are interested in our coaching program and they go, well, I can see they're trying to save money, which I understand. I get that. Um, and they say, well, you know, I'll sign up when I get interest. I'm like, it's putting the cart before the horse. I find that most inventors, they, do, they don't do the right marketing. They don't do the right research. They don't have the right list of companies. They're not reaching out the right way. They don't know how to interact with the company once they do get interest. So I get people that are like, I'm like, yeah, sure, you can do that. You can sign up after you get interest. But I have to tell you, like 95% of the people that I see that say that, they never call me back because they never got there because they didn't do the right things to get there. But Pepe, if you're like, but at the same time, I think you guys should all go for it. You don't always have to all have to sign up for invent, right? In our coaching. And if you want to go for it on your own and you're like, I know that I can count on these guys if I get a deal on the table and then I'll sign up, you can do that. But the problem is you might be beating your head up against a brick wall. You might be doing a lot of the wrong things. You know, you can't look at a book or a video and ask a question, but you can your coach or the coach will say for your product, do this. And so that's the big difference between even a QA and a like this, we're not talking about or looking at your product, which we can't because it would be public disclosure with everybody listening in um, and uh, and the coaching. So um, let's see. OK, uh, Mike, I submitted my product to a few companies, got some no's, but they told me to keep submitting ideas. Excellent. And they, they won't always say that, but you can keep doing that or you can ask, hey, you know, I know you're not interested in this one. Can I keep submitting other products? You always do that. Um, and they'll think you're very professional. And they gave me categories and help on what they're looking for. Wow, that rocks, man. That's great. That's a great company, Mike. you got to stick with them. That's you, Sometimes you'll ask and they won't even give that to you. They're like, man, that's kind of like we want to keep that close. We don't know who else you're working with. We don't want anybody else to know. So that's great. But that's one of those examples. And for you, it just happened. I don't think you actively asked for it. But if you ask, and this is uh, getting used to what you might see as re rejection, but it's just work, right? So let's say you asked, let's say you approached 30 companies. And every single one, when they said no, you asked, are they open to more ideas? And you also asked, can you, if, if it's okay, you can tell me what you're looking for, what categories and things. And let's say only one in five gave you an answer. Well, one in five out of 60, what's that six? So now you have six companies telling you what they're looking for. Like you have to get used to that. And that licensing your inventions is much more that and that kind of thinking and that kind of work than it is about the invention. The invention is five to 10% at most. I would say 5%. Now, you, if you do everything right and your inventions don't make any sense at all, you know, okay, it, you, can't, I'm, you can't have just a completely idiotic idea that doesn't make any sense in the marketplace, all right. But if the product makes sense, it's, it's about doing the work and being really persistent, you know? Um, and, you know, one of the things I've been saying a lot lately to our students, and I think I've been saying it on these, these free chats too, is when a company says no, it doesn't even mean that they didn't like your product. Because you're not licensing, when you're making that initial outreach, you're not licensing it to a company. You're not trying to get interest from a, let's put it that way. You're trying to get interest from a person. And they're just like you and me. And they're a marketing manager. They've got three bosses giving them different stuff to do. And they're inundated with email. They're overwhelmed just like you and me, right? And so uh, they might have liked your product, but they didn't want to give you an inkling that they did because they're like, I just have too much stuff to do. So they say, not at this time, not a right match for us. And so that's when you reach back out six or eight months later. That's why you, you should always send to companies that said no, that didn't give you specific reasons why not. Because then you send it six months later, eight months later, what have you. You don't give up on the project. You moved on to other projects maybe. And that same person that said no, now they're like two weeks earlier, just timing. Their boss said, we need new products. And that same person that said no is now showing interest, you know. But if they if they know you're just going to latch on to them, if if you give any if they give you any inkling that that it's a they like it and it's a cool product, and then they're worried the inventor might get paranoid. Well, this is a cool product, but then why don't they want it? Why don't they want it? You know, it's like so they're they're people just like you and me. And yeah, the company will end up licensing it, but that Superman or Superwoman, they're just people like you and me. So don't even assume that they didn't like your product when they say no, when they give you a non-specific no. Now, if they say, well, not because of this, okay. 
and then you can't fix that, okay, don't resubmit to that company. You're done with that. And don't resubmit like two weeks later either um, for the ones that gave you non-specific no's. Um, yeah, so Mike, good on you, man, for uh, getting a, a company to tell you what categories they're looking for and what types of products. That's fantastic. Um, that's amazing. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Listen to Invent Right people. They rock. Um, uh, J Bell. Hi, Andrew. J Bell here. How do you know if a company is selling what they say they sold and paying the right royalties? For example, they sold 10,000 but only give you royalties for 1,000. Um, first of all, there's a couple of things you can do there. There's a lot of things. We won't go over them all, but you, you can talk to their salespeople. If you can keep in touch and make friends with people and not all inventors are social, I get that. But if you're not, you got to make an effort to be more social and talk to the salesperson. So you can get in there and you say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm the inventor of such and such, this product, and, and I license it to your company. And uh, I know you're in sales. Do you have any Do you have any feedback about how people are perceiving this product? Oh yeah, no, they love that thing. Yeah, I, I talked to somebody the other day and they like this. And so, how are sales going? Oh, they're going great, man. You know, and they can tell you. You could, and you can also see how many stores they're in. Like, if it's in a big box store, if it's not selling one unit per week per store, and they're in thirteen thousand WalMarts or however many there are, maybe in a district or what have you, um, they're going to pull it. So if you see it in the store, you know it's at least it's selling one unit per week per store. You know, Otherwise, it's going to be pulled. So you can look at where it's selling. You can talk to salespeople. Um, I really haven't had, I can only think of one inventor um, that told me like, I straight up know they're screwing me and I'm pulling the deal. Like in 21 years, with students in 65 countries, and our students are doing deals all the time. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. If it happened with a company, it, it would be much more likely to happen with a small company. You know, people think, oh, these big companies are going to try to screw me. It's like it's the small ones that aren't accountable to a board of directors um, and things like that. But the bigger ones are way less likely to screw you. And when they do, it was usually a mistake. It was usually a mistake. Like maybe they got bought out by a different company. They stopped paying your royalties. It's mean to trying to screw you. You got lost in the shuffle and you got to remind them like, oh, we didn't pay your royalties for, for two quarters, you know? And it's like, so sorry. Like when we got bought out by this other company, there was this transition it's things like that. And I, was, I can't remember last time I saw that either. So um, I don't see it as a problem. I really don't. Uh, now, with that said, every single contract that we have our students do has an audit clause. And if you audit them, usually the way that we set it up, if you audit them and they are off more than 5%, they need to pay for the audit. If it's off less than 5%, you need to pay for the audit. But think about this. You're sending an accountant, forensic accountant, go in there and audit their books. That's not very warm and fuzzy. you know. But if you think so, things are really wrong, you have the right to do that. Now, it will cost you with that accountant. Um, and that's why you always want to track your royalties on the wholesale price, the price they sell to the retailer for, because it's very easy to look at that accounting and it's, it can't hide stuff with how you define net. That's a whole nother conversation. If you make the contract, which we always do with our students, simple, it's going to be easy for an accountant to go in there and figure out what's really going on. Um, I can't think of a single student ever in 21 years that's ever done that. I can't think of it. Maybe maybe one of our students has and they didn't let me know. But um, but you have the right to do that. You should always have that in a licensing agreement. So hopefully that was helpful, J Bell. And you know, a hundred percent of nothing by never trying to license anything is nothing. You know, so you gotta make the effort. You gotta trust people to a certain extent. People for the most part are good. People, all, people out there aren't a bunch of sleazeballs. I talked to you about that travel vlogger that I watch on YouTube, and he says people are good. You know, um, he's I watched I watched him, and he he's like going to these different um, countries. You know, very poor countries, and there's places where he'll go to restaurants or he'll get a tea or coffee. They now he's filming, I guess, but they won't let him pay. 
And I'm like, whoa, like, do you see that happening in the US? I don't see anybody going to Starbucks. Oh, you don't have to pay. It's like, so there, I thought that was so cool. Um, people are for the most part good. So you got to trust people, but you got, you kind of get a spidey sense about things when you know what to look for. So those are some things to look for. And I'm um, not saying it's never going to happen, but I think for it's, it's an anomaly. You can't run your life through the things that are very unlikely to happen. You just need to hear from me, it's very unlikely to happen, and maybe that makes you feel more comfortable. So I think it was great you asked the question, but I have inventors that ask me questions, students, non-students, and, and especially with students, and they ask a question, and I'm like, I have never seen that happen. Or they'll ask another question, I'm like, oh, that happens all the time, here's how you handle you know, and so when you give an inventor perspective there, they're getting decades of experience on what is common and what's not. And if that uncommon, incredibly uncommon thing was really stressing them out and that was holding them back, great, we remove that stress. And now they know it's an anomaly. Now, also, if it's like, oh, that happens all the time, but here's how you handle it. It's like, oh, okay, good. It's going to happen often. And this here's how I'm going to handle it. So that's very, very empowering. Um, uh thank you sports channel great uh, content every week thank you um okay uh devin said company accepting my ideas with a provisional patent as far as any protection they think it's irrelevant well uh devin what i would say is why are you telling them it's a provisional now you might not be doing this i'm playing devil's advocate for just so everybody gets educated when you send a sell sheet or a marketing piece, you put patent pending on it. Legally, you can put patent pending. You don't have to write provisional patent pending. Now, if they ask, you should always say yes, it's a provisional. But um, so you might be doing something wrong there. You might be saying um, dumb things like, when well, this is a dumb thing. I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm just saying this is a dumb thing to say. I want to sell you my patent. Like, you never say that. I think I said that last week. You never say that. You're selling the benefit of your product. You never say, I want to sell you my patent. I want to license you this product that I think is a good match for your product line. That's something that you would say. So, Devin, you're welcome to type in more details there. But um, if they're looking at the product, I don't know if you're getting interest. And then they're saying provisional patents are totally not irrelevant. It's a placeholder in time. You could later get a patent and reference the provisional. and You'd have protection from that date. So I don't know what industry you're in. Some industries are patent obsessed. But if you type a little bit more and if we have time, I can expand upon that. Um, but uh, put patent pending. So that's a good lesson for everybody. I try to answer people's questions where I'm not just answering that one person's question, but I'm giving good information for everybody. And sometimes I don't have all the information from your question, so I'm making up what I think you're saying. And so don't get upset if, if I don't specifically answer your question because when you coach somebody, and you're talking to them about their particular product, I can definitively say this is the right thing to do in this situation. But when you're in a live chat, you've got to be a little bit more broad, um, you know, with how you answer things. Um, uh, Jake, Jack said, do companies like Stanley, Irwin, Husky honor a patent? Tool companies are tough. They are, they are tough companies. Um, I can't comment on any particular company. I wouldn't make a statement about any particular company. Uh, you got to be careful about that when you're in a public you know, YouTube show. But um, if you're doing a tool, uh, you, need, you need, but yes, I think the provisional patent is, is fine. And, um, but here's the problem with, with tool. The, the tool company is the problem. Here, I'm going to give you my unbiased viewpoint here of tool companies. And we've had students licensed to tool companies, of course. Um, I'm just going to say it. So the tool companies, I think there's a little too much testosterone running through their blood, right? I think they need to get some more level-headed guys and some women in there. And there's they're a little, eh, you know, well, if you don't have a patent, then, uh, you know, it's like, and, and that's so old school. It really is. Now, there's plenty of tool companies that don't feel like that. But some of them kind of do. Like, if you don't have a pretty solid pad, they're not doing a deal with you. That's all in the tool companies. Okay? They're a little old school. Now, now what's on the inventors is every handyman um, 
on the face of the planet is an inventor, essentially, like 90% of them. So they don't know what the hell they're doing with licensing. They approach these big tool companies, and then the big tool companies know that they don't know what the hell they're doing, and they take advantage of them. Oh, no, we'll just pay you five grand and be done with it. And the handyman's like, well, okay. you know, And they're, so they're screwing it up for the rest of you is what they're doing. Because when these tool companies are able to do shitty deals with – inventors that don't know what the hell they're doing when that invention could have earned them, you know, $300,000 over its life or more. And they were settled for five grand, you know, oh, okay, give me 10 grand or whatever. They're messing you up as a professional inventor. And so I see those as the two factors with tool companies. Another, a third thing that makes tool, I'm not going to discourage you from working on tools. I have plenty of people license tools, but when you look at a chart and I forget what our head coach said, but I've seen the chart before. All the the comp they're owned by essentially eight. All the tool companies are essentially owned by eight. And so you thought they're separate companies, but when you see the flow chart, this company also is this one, this is a child of this one, as a child of this one, and you're like, oh crap. You know, and so when companies get really, really big and they dominate a category, they don't need to innovate as much. Now they they have com competition and stuff, and they, they do need to innovate, don't get me wrong. But um, that's the third problem. So one too much testosterone. They're kind of old school, which I don't see in other categories. And they're like, they really, patents are more important to them. You got inventors that are clueless, that are handyman, that are willing to settle for what they shouldn't. They should get trained by invent, right? And then you got like eight big companies that own, I, don't quote me on this, like 80% of the tool companies. And you just don't realize they own another one who owns another one. And they, they're they're all on each other. So those are the things that make uh, tools difficult. But it, if you get interest, you can upgrade that provisional. They can give you the money. You can upgrade. So, But to run out and to spend $10,000 on a patent because you saw some tool companies said, we only license patented products. It's freaking ridiculous. You know, like you're going to spend 10 grand and then nobody shows interest in the product, like spend 75 bucks on a provisional, see if there's interest, you get some legs, then you can always upgrade and file a full utility, get some of that advanced money to pay for the utility path. So, um, you know, so they are tough, but yeah, we have students that have licensed with provisionals to tool companies. So, um, but, uh, oh, that, that wasn't Devin, that was, that was Jock. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Beacon Builders, can you buy call lists of contacts in different industries? No, it's a complete, utter, ridiculous, ludicrous waste of time, Beacon. Um, and by the way, if you guys want to type your first name, then I don't have to read your handles. I can address you by your real name. Just your first name is fine. Um, no, you need to make your list of companies that's right for your particular product. Are students through that to figure out, oh, well, for that product, you could find companies doing this product and this product. And you're only looking in these retailers. You can look in other retailers. People limit their list of companies like you wouldn't believe. It's extremely rare that we have a new InventRight student where they're like, hey, here's my 30 companies. It's like, and if they do, it's a lot of them are wrong. It's like, here's two or three. And the coach is like, you can have like 30 on this. You're not looking at this the right way. So we, it's a, a methodology. It's an approach. We train our students to figure it out, out an ideal list. It's not ideal. Maybe you have like A-listers and your B and you're like, B is a little bit of a stretch, but pretty good. A is like, ooh, these are perfect. And then C is like, well, what the hell? I'm going to call these guys too. And so you like A, B, and C list. And, um, and then reach out and not be timid about reaching out. Um, when people aren't familiar with reaching out um, and spending all that time, inventors don't think inventing is spending all that effort to reach out. They think inventing is inventing and it's not. It's it, inventing is like this and the rest of it's like this, you know, which is reaching out to companies, making a good marketing presentation, making your list of companies. That's what it means to be an inventor. You're just a person with ideas until you show it to a company. So if you don't know how to properly show it to companies, are you an inventor? I don't think so. I think you're a person with ideas. The second you call your first company, you're an inventor. That's a weird delineation, but I, I believe that. Um, um, Tonya said, have people actually become millionaires from licensing certain products? Yes, but I don't think that most people will become 
a multimillionaire off of one product. Um, if a product is earning you 50K a year in royalties, sells for five years, well, that's a quarter million dollars. You're not a millionaire, are you? Um, if it's earning 100K a year and sells for five years, it's a half a million dollars. Now, if a, if a product's earning you 100K a year and it sells for 10 years, that's a million dollars. But um, how many products sell for 10 years? Some do, a lot don't. Some are a flash in the pan, they go crazy. For their on as seen on TV product, they go crazy for like two or three years and then just disappear or the sales just start to go down. Others just keep chugging along, chugging along. So um, can you make become a millionaire off licensing? Yes, I think with most people, it's going to be off of multiple products. It's not going to be off of one product, to be honest. Um, are there products that you can become a multimillionaire with? Absolutely, you can. Um, Ryan, this isn't, he's not a millionaire by any means, but well, I don't know, but I interviewed Ryan Bricker. He did the whiskey wedge and they have sold 1 million units of his whiskey wedge product. And I think that interview will go up later this week. And I did with him. That's a great interview. Um, do I think he made a million dollars on that product? Uh, I don't think so. Not yet, but you know, the product could continue to sell for another four or five years, you know? Um, I have no idea how much he made on that. I didn't ask him. It's kind of a little bit rude to do that. Um, so my answer, Tonya, is if you want to become a millionaire, multimillionaire, you need to be working on multiple products. You need to have licensed multiple products in most instances. Um, when you earn money with licensing, it's three things. People get obsessed with the royalty rate. Um, and people go, oh, why would I want to earn 5% or just 10%? You know, when I could get a 30% profit margin, I'm like, yeah, you can sell your 1,000 units or 3,000 units for a website that barely anybody visits and get a 30% profit margin. Or that big company can sell half a million units and you're getting a 7% royalty or whatever it is. So usually for most consumer products, between 5 and 10%, 5% being the most common. But we have plenty of students that, that get more. Um, but it's the royalty rate. And then you're getting the royalty rate on the price of the product. And so is it a 99 cent product? Is it a $500 product? That's going to be a pretty big difference. But then the biggest thing is, well, it's not the biggest thing. All three of those things are important. The third thing is the volume. So when you talk to a company, you qualify them as to what kind of volume they can do. So royalty rate, price of the product, and the volume. That is going to help you figure out how much money you can make. And you need to do some numbers on that and then hold them to it in the licensing agreement in the way of minimum guarantees. You don't know how much they're gonna do, but they're taking all the risk. Um, but Tonya, yeah, most people don't become a millionaire off of one product. Are there products where people do that that they've licensed? Absolutely. But you're probably gonna have to license more than one product to do that. Um, so it might be a little gag novelty gift that you license to a mom and pop gag novelty gift company. And you know you only earn eight thousand dollars over its total life, but you have to ask yourself when you're licensing and your goal is to make money, why am I working on that product? You know because it's really not any harder to license to a mom and pop novelty gift company, you know that has very minimal distribution, than to license a product that would be in a Walmart and a Target and it's this big company, and um, so. You have to, you know, pick your projects carefully. At the beginning, I think it's good to get going with anything, you know, so just to get the experience, you know, and most inventors are really passionate about their ideas and it's not about money and it's a total cliche, but you do what you love, the money will come. It's very true with licensing. You do what you love. Now you need to learn to love all the stuff that, that is not the ideation, the creation, the invention. You need to learn to love that, but you love your invention, pushes you to do all the crap that you don't want to do. Now, it's not as bad as starting a business. It's not nearly as much work. You can spend two to six hours a week and you can license products, but it's still work. And that's a little bit of a shock for an inventor going, well, I just thought I'd call a company or two and I'd license it. And it's not, not the case. But if you plug along at two to six hours a week, that's what we tell our students and it works. Um, you can get stuff done. Um, uh, Sforis's channel, how do you prevent China from stealing an idea once it's in a U.S. patent office? So, so patents protect you in the countries in which you hold them. People don't understand this. So if China wanted to knock off your idea, 
they're not technically allowed to sell it in the United States because you have a U.S. patent. You could prevent them sell from selling it in the United States, right? If they were infringing on your patent. But it's changing. But China doesn't mark. There's a bunch of junk on Amazon where Chinese companies are on there. It's usually selling more generic stuff. But companies you license to are going to be U.S., Canadian, or European for the most part. And they're getting stuff made in China. But the Chinese companies aren't marketing stuff still to this day. There's some that are. Um, but so I don't know why people are so worried about that. It's it's quite often, it's not the Chinese company that knocks you off. It's the American company that knocks you off. And they're getting it made in China, just like your original licensee maybe is too. So it's not, it's not, it's, I, I th find it funny that people blame China. They're usually American companies or Canadian or European companies, they're knocking your product off and they're getting it made in China and China's not knocking it off. Now, China wants to knock it off and sell it in China. You really can't prevent that from happening anyway. I mean, it's really, I mean, some people say you can these days. I'm not buying it. Um, so now I've been hearing um, that some licensees, companies license a product to, they do want to get, if they're in a particular industry that's problematic, they will get a Chinese patent because it makes it, easier for them to stop those knockoff manufacturers from manufacturing that in, in China that way. So a few of them will do that. I'm seeing that as a more prevalent technique. That's not something you would really need to worry about. Um, uh, you know, maybe that's something that you work out with the licensee. So I do see that sometimes, but um, if your company you license to is selling 80% of the product and the knockoffs are selling 20%, congratulations, you're successful. The big company that you uh, license to, they'll send cease and desist. They should. Um, and that costs them like next to nothing. It's a letter from their attorney. But for them to run around and suing all these knockoffs, they're like, eh, we're not making enough money there. you know. And they could be making a lot of money. It still might not be enough money for them to justify hiring an attorney to sue the infringer. Because you, know, you have to interpret a patent. And that is all up to interpretation. Like a trademark, you're knocking off my trademark. Like if somebody came up with invent right, that's very clear, it's a word, right? But patents are all up to interpretation. So, but the big benefit for you guys, when you license to a big company, you kind of are that big company and the knockoffs, some of them, most of them are afraid of that big company. So when they send cease and desist, the knockoffs stop a percentage of the time. Sometimes they say, screw you, we're not gonna, we're gonna do whatever. But congratulations, to think the misperception that a patent is going to protect you is truly a misperception. It's just perceived protection. So if your big company that you license to is selling 80% of the product, Knox is selling 20%, and you as the inventor are so upset about that and so worried about that, get your head on straight. It's the, it's the way things work. It's the business world. And I've seen inventors that have ventured and sold products themselves and um, they've spent insane amounts of money suing everybody that does anything like their product and they wish they hadn't. And big companies know better than that. So they'll say cease and desist, but, um, but don't think that a patent is gonna protect you in every way, shape or form. It's just a right to sue and it costs a freaking million dollars at least to sue somebody in that area. So it's very um, difficult, but, most people abide by it. Most people respect it. But don't think it's protection. It's just perceived protection any way you slice it. And you got to be okay with that. And um, I, uh, I really see very few of our students that have an issue with the, when they license to a company. And then somebody, I, I can't remember where, I do know of one, but he made million, th this guy made millions of dollars. He made millions of dollars with his product. And then a ton of people knocked him off. His patent got invalidated. And that sucks. It was very unusual. I can't think of another one besides him personally off the top of my head. Um, so, but if you, it's good I'm addressing these things. If you're not going to move forward because you don't have 100% protection against anything ever going wrong or everything going just the way that you decide in your head, don't do this. Don't do business. Just get a job, work a day job, get your check. That's business. You can reduce your risk as far as you can, but there's a point at which there's a diminishing point of returns where you're not 
you're just hurting yourself out of your own paranoia. So that is smart, being smart about it. And at EventRight, we teach you to be smart about that. But most of what we do is showing you how to license your product, not showing you how to be paranoid about all the weird things that barely ever go wrong. Um, we're teaching you how to, and that's why our students license stuff when other people don't, because most uh, uh, patent attorneys sell fear, not most, I shouldn't say most, a percentage of patent attorneys sell fear. It's subtle, but they cater to the misbeliefs you already have about patents that is this great protection, which it's not. Um, let's see. Samuel is saying, how do I make a sell sheet? So a sell sheet is just a one-page advertisement. So, and it's for their customer. It's not for them. We're going to make millions. If we only get 2% of the market, this is a big idea. We put patent pending big across the bottom. Don't do any of that stuff. It's an advertisement for their customers. So if a company is doing a gardening products and it's a gardening trowel, you know, show the advertising as if they were advertising their customer. Let the marketing manager see it and go, ooh, if our customers saw this, they would want to buy it. That's what you want to do. OK, um, so I can't go into all the details. Who is that? That's a good question, Samuel. But um, and most inventors suck at that. Now, some inventors are good at it, but you need to be great at it. So the reason why I don't understand it, to be honest with you, I'm naturally a marketing person. I, I study marketing. School. I didn't learn crap about marketing in school. I learned it by doing it. But that's not natural for everybody. It kind of boggles my mind, though, that we live in, in the United States, for those who live in the U.S., we're such a consumerist society. You're constantly bombarded with these advertising images and texts and all this. We should all be great marketers. It should come naturally to us, but it doesn't to people. Now, with that said, in your defense, um, sometimes you'll get people that are professional marketers. And because it's their own product, because it's close to them, that's why they don't do it good, do a good job. So we've had students that are professional marketers, and the coach is like, this is okay, but it's not accomplishing that six to 10 seconds. I got it. We need to change it up. Where that same inventor that's one of our students, if they did a marketing piece for somebody else, they probably do a decent job. But they're right because it's their own product. I get that. And you get better at as you go. But it can't be okay. It's got to be like, and it doesn't have to be a mind-blowing product. It needs to be like, I get the benefit right away. And my customer would get the benefit right away. If you make them think you're toast, no PowerPoint presentations, no rambling emails, one page. Or if it's a video, a 15 to 60 second video, never longer than 60 seconds. Occasionally, we'll let our students go a minute and a half, but that's, you shouldn't. Um, so. Uh, so it can be a video sell sheet or it can be a sell sheet, a physical sell sheet. It's a PDF that you email. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's Samuel is a good question. I appreciate it. Um, uh, that's cool. That's interesting. Like everybody showed up late. That's, that's interesting. We have a decent attendance now at the very beginning. Um, it was really, really small. I don't, I'm going to find out if we gave everybody the right link, or maybe everybody's just late today. You guys had things to do. Hey, I understand. Show up anytime. Um, uh, uh, John said, any advice on licensing a product by connecting a brand with a product manufacturer similar to how Steven did with the Michael Jordan and the toy company. So no, I, so that people get confused on that story. So uh, Steven noticed, this is eons ago. I don't know, what is this now? InventRight's been around 21 years. This is like 26 years ago or something. He did the Michael Jordan wall ball, my business partner or other co-founder. So there was Ohio Art, was a toy company. And you know, have a little Nerf basketball games and you put it on your door. And it's, you know, backboards like this big, it has a little basket and you throw the nerf in there. Okay. So Steven noticed it was in a box and it said, and it had a tiny little picture of Michael Jordan in the bottom right hand corner. And Steven was like, they're not fully utilizing the Michael Jordan license. Like they got Michael Jordan endorsing this product, but the backboard was just a square white backboard, like a regular backboard. So he said, why, well, why not? 
make the backboard something else. So he, he said, well, let's make the backboard an image of Michael Jordan from like the torso up. And they loved it. Um, what I would say is I don't think that's always a good way to invent. Um, I think it's a waste of time most of the time, not all the time. So, you know, when I say things or Steven says things, we're not saying 100% of the time this is what you do. People like to make things really black and white. But if Steven didn't sell that to Ohio Art, he should be trying to license it to a bunch of other toy companies too. I know I'm not a big believer in inventing for one company. Now, if you can invent and help this one company improve their product, but you take a look and once you know how to make your list of companies, you're like, okay, well, if they're not interested, I have at least 15 other companies or 10 other companies that could license this too. Great, go for it. But if it's just, just this one company, it wouldn't be right for anybody else. Now, sometimes people think that and I look at it, I'm like, no, this would be right for other people too, or a variation would be right for other people. So, um, so you're trying to connect a brand with the product manufacturer. No, when you when you license John, um, the brand is the manufacturer. So the, the you're misunderstanding that story. So the brand, they you don't care if it's a toy company or another kind of company, you don't care if they have their own captive plan or if they're getting a contract manufacturing in China. It doesn't matter. They have a brand. So the brand you license to is always the manufacturer. Again. Not 100% of the time, but always the manufacturer. So, yeah, you just find the brand and that's who you license to. So hopefully that's helpful. I'm sure a lot of other people are confused on that as well. So um, great question. Uh, Alexander, where can we find a real-life PPA associated with a granted patent? other than Stephen Key's ones. Uh, I don't know. I don't think many people disclose that. They don't like, oh, I licensed this product, and here was my original PPA, and here was the, the patent. Um, I think there is a little bit of a problem there when you look at PPAs other people filed. That's why we give our students that smart IP software, because it guides you on customizing it for your product. Otherwise, people start to do these terrible hack jobs like, oh, I see that, I like that, and I'll just take that over here. It's a good learning experience, I think, but, um, you know, so I, I don't think it's necessary, Alexander. Um, and to be honest, the PPA is not important. You know, I mean, you wanna do a good job with it, but if you do a crappy job with your sell sheet, no, they're not gonna wanna look at your PPA. So I don't know why people get so obsessed with PPA. Well, I know why, because it's new, and. You know, un your Uncle Bob looks at your product. Well, you know, it's very complimentary when your friends and family, when you show them your product, and they're like, their first thing is, well, you better get a patent on that. What they're really saying is, they're giving you terrible advice, first off, but what they're really saying is, that's a great idea. I like it. Take it for that. Doesn't mean you should get a patent. But the problem is, most people, when their relatives, friends, and family tell us it's a great idea, you better get a patent on that, they actually write and get a patent. Why would you spend 10 grand on a patent? You spend 75 bucks. Go fishing off the pier, see if there's interest. So um, when people tell you you better get a patent on that, realize what they're really saying is that's a good idea. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but that's a good idea. You know, as far as because they don't understand what a patent is, that doesn't have the value that you think it does. And they're the patent off office has rife with patents that people did just that. They filed a patent, they never did anything else. They thought the world would be a path through the door, so they get bad advice. Um, Matt Miller said, can I use smart IP software because my computer is down? Um, yeah, actually you could, Matt. Um, our software for smart IP is, is web-based, so you could do that. Might be a little small on your phone, but you could do that on your phone, you could do it on your iPad, whatever, yeah. Um, uh, I I think it's amazing what people get done on their phone. Um, it really is. I I'm a I got like three monitors here, um, and I try to do everything on my computer. I don't want to. However, I've been on the road where I'll get on my phone. I'm like, damn. I'm like, sometimes I don't have as many distractions on my phone, so I can kind of focus. It has some advantages. But people trying to use an iPad or a phone as a computer, big mistake. And the problem is. 
the people that don't own a computer now you were saying that yours is just broken that's fine but people that don't own a computer try to use an ipad or a phone because they don't have the computer skills they're the worst people to try to do complicated stuff on their phone or ipad you actually need to be pretty geeky um like i literally don't know how to make an attachment on my ipad because i wouldn't bother i would just go to my computer but in a lot of people, so it's harder to do advanced stuff on an iPad or phone. Now you see a lot of older senior citizens just using iPads and stuff because they're just surfing the web, they're playing some games and stuff. And I get that. But when you try to do more advanced, just basic stuff on a computer, like creating an email with an attachment or bookmarking stuff, it's harder on your phone or iPad. But if you're geeky, you can do it. But the people that tend to not want to use a computer at all they're the people that are actually less computer geeky and they should get on a computer. I don't know if I was explaining that well. So when we have new students that say, I don't have a computer, we're like, you need to get one. And we even have a series of trainings. You need to understand how to make attachments, do some basic stuff before you can become a student of ours. And because you need, I don't care if you get a hundred dollar used PC, you don't need anything fancy, you know, but you, you need you need to have the most basic computer skills, know how to bookmark stuff in a browser, know how to surf the internet, know when you save an attachment, where it's saved to on your computer. And I'm, I don't mean to be laughing. I think that I understand some people don't have those skills, but you need to have those basic skills if you don't. So, um, so I think I'm at the hour here. Okay, I remember. Uh, got it. An Annelton. I was trying to. Annelton. Yeah, I remember you last time. Hi, Andrew. I want to thank you for the info you gave me last time live. I now found a big contact at Wall. They're a razor company um, in the Netherlands. Now let's hope for the best. Oh, good for you, man. That's nice to see people making progress based on the stuff I said before. Um, Newman. Uh, Andrew, thank you for taking your time and being here. So I want to guys ask you guys a favor. You know, if you've been on here before, I've asked this before, if you could do uh, two things for me. The easiest thing, right down below, I believe when we do these live, I need to check. In these live chats, click on the subscribe button. I would like to get from 48,000 subscribers to 80,000 subscribers in six to eight months. And so it doesn't take any effort to do that. You know, if you're like, I never subscribed to anything on YouTube, it just, it's not going to do anything. You just click subscribe, it raises your subscriber rate. YouTube looks at that and they look upon that favorably. Um, also, when you're watching our videos, give us as many thumbs up as you can on as many videos as you can. So, in exchange, you don't have to, but if you felt like the advice is great, I think it's pretty damn good advice considering I'm not charging guys a dime for this. And we're all about empowering inventors. Please do that for us. Um, really appreciate that. Click thumbs up on all the videos. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Okay. The other thing you can do is if you've read our book, One Simple Idea, um, go on to Amazon and write a review. It can be a one sentence review and give us five stars. I think between the expanded version and the older version, when you add those two together, we're almost we're at 800 now. I think we're try. I don't know if we're at 800. I think we're just about there. Maybe we just need a few more. So if you could write a review on. Uh, of one simple idea, our book. If you haven't got the book, it's a great book. It's totally worth it. And I think you can get it on CD as well as on um, Kindle. And then you can order the actual paper version. It used to be on Audible, but I think our publisher had some fight or something with Amazon. For some reason, it's not on Audible anymore and you can't get it except on a CD. Isn't that archaic? That's ridiculous. Um, I, I never looked into that. Doesn't matter. It is what it is. Um, all our books after One Simple Idea, we all self-publish, so we have complete control uh, over that. Um, thank you, Gemini. Stellar advice. Um, Alexander, th thank you. Uh, Kyle, thank you. V, Stefan. Um, uh, Stefan said... I think Andrew started an hour early. Ah, now I know why some people were late. No, my it's from four to five Pacific, and it's five right now, and I'm ending. So um, 
No, I was right on track. Maybe you forgot to set your, your clock forward an hour or what have you. But that's probably why um, I had people show up late. I was trying, I was like, do we include the wrong link? Um, so, but it's kind of, that was on Saturday, the time changed, but maybe in other countries is different. I don't know. But anyway, I'll let you guys go. Um, thank you. Take care. Keep inventing. I will be back here next Monday. Take a look at InventRight and our coaching program on InventRight if you're interested. And we'd be happy to talk to you about that if you're interested. Otherwise, I'll see you back here on Monday if you're available. Take care, everybody. Bye.